Praise be Jesus and Mary. In today's gospel passage taken from Luke chapter 9, we see our Lord determined to travel to Jerusalem where he'll be crucified for our sins. And in order to get there, he had to pass through Samaria. St. Luke tells us in verse 53 that the Samaritans wouldn't receive him because he was heading for Jerusalem. For the Samaritans, the real place for worshiping God, for worshiping God was Mount Gerizim, which was in their territory, not in Judea. We see this in the conversation between our Lord and the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, when she says, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, meaning Mount Gerizim. But you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. That's John 4, verse 20. There was a lot of bitterness and hostility between the Jews and Samaritans, not only because of competing sanctuaries, but also for racial reasons as well, because the Samaritans had intermarried with the Gentiles centuries before, and also they had honored false gods, false gods as well. So the response of the apostles, James and John, at this refusal of the Samaritans to welcome Jesus is to say to the Master, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? It's Luke 9, verse 54. Now, at first glance, it sounds like a just response. Right? John the Baptist had spoken of the Messiah as one who brings fire. Right? I baptize you with water, John said, but he who is mightier than I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Luke 3, 16. Also, the great prophet Elijah himself had called down fire from heaven to consume the enemies of God in the Old Testament, enemies which the then king of Samaria had sent against the prophet, as we read in 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 1. The Greek word for zeal, which is used in the New Testament, is zelos. For example, it says in John 2, verse 17, that Jesus' disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, zelos. That's where we get the word zealous from. So there is such a thing as holy zeal, which our Lord himself had. But there's also unholy zeal as well. The problem that many in the church have today is not that we've got an unholy zeal. The problem is that we don't have any zeal at all. For a lot of us, don't have zeal. Spiritual sloth is a greater problem in the church than unholy zeal is. And sometimes the people who complain about those who are zealous, sometimes they're complaining because they themselves are mediocre and lukewarm. And mediocrity often doesn't like to be shown up or brought to light, right? So the Lord says... To the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16, he says, I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, but neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Lukewarmness, he says. So always, we need to examine ourselves before we go around correcting others about their zeal. Obviously, it's the first thing we should do. But that being said... We see in today's gospel that James and John not only had zeal for the Lord, but they also had tremendous faith when you look at what they were saying. They were confident that they could call down fire from heaven and inflict punishment on Samaria by the hand of God. Our Lord responded to the sons of thunder, as he called them, James and John. He responded, warning them that not all religious zeal is holy zeal. Not all righteous indignation is really righteous. Luke 9, verse 55 says that Jesus turned and rebuked them. Actually, if you have the Vulgate or, or the Douay Reims version, it adds that our Lord said to them, You do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So in the name of Christ, James and John were about to offend Christ. When you think about it, if the Lord hadn't corrected them, they would have done that. One commentator on this passage, an archbishop named John McKelvey in the 19th century, he said here that Jesus is saying to them this. He's saying, you imagine that you're influenced by zeal for God's glory and a feeling of just resentment in imitation of Elijah of old. But you seem not to be aware that the spirit you're influenced by is a human spirit of impatience and vengeance. And he continues having our Lord say to the apostles, 
commentator, he says, the spirit you manifest is that of the old law under which Elijah acted, the spirit of retaliation, demanding an eye for an eye. But my spirit, which you are to imitate, is a spirit of meekness, of patience, and forgiveness. So what spirit is moving our religious zeal, if we have any zeal, if we have any? At least having zeal is a good thing, right? Is our religious zeal motivated by the spirit of the Lord, or is it motivated by another spirit? Not all spirits are equal. Not all spirits are holy. Certainly apostles here are full of zeal, but the one thing that they're lacking is actually the hallmark of St. Luke's gospel. St. Luke's gospel is called the gospel of mercy. That's a big piece of the puzzle that's missing here. Charity and mercy are the missing pieces of the puzzle for a number of us who profess to be very religious and yet completely miss the mark on what it means to be a follower of Christ. Our Lord says in the gospel, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So Luke 6, verse 45. So if we really want to know what's in people's hearts, a lot of times all we have to do is listen to them. For example, whenever we're bitter or really fearful about things or if we're zealous for truth and justice, but we scoff at things like charity and mercy and forgiveness, or if we distort those things even, then we're really not getting it. We're really missing the heart of the gospel. Our Lord's condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23 is a good point of meditation on those who seem devout, but something's not quite right about their devotedness. Something's not quite right about their zeal and their spirituality. Even St. Paul said of the Jews who were fervently attached to the observance of the law, he said, I bear witness to them that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened, he said, Romans 10, 2. And the apostle confesses of himself that before his conversion, he was a, ze a zealous persecutor of the church. Right? We read that in Philippians 3, 6. So there is such a thing as an un unenlightened zeal, as an unholy zeal. And it's not just the zeal of the secular zealots who are zealous of dechristianizing the Western world. Their zeal, of course, is very unholy. Uh, but those, there's also an unholy unenlightened religious zeal as well. We've explained this before in previous reflections. I think some of us in our pride uh, aren't open to the truth about these things or to the truth about our own defects and shortcomings. Some of us really aren't open to the truth that God wants to change our hearts first and foremost. Sometimes we want to change everyone else, but in grace, embracing the gospel is not about changing everyone else, right? It's about changing my own mind and my own heart first and foremost. There's much reason in our country and even in our culture to want to call down fire from heaven from God. There's much reason for that, as James and John did. The fact that, for example, you've got an entire political party whose core social party policies are predominantly anti-Christian. That's a big problem. The fact that sin and scandal and godlessness is all around us, even in the church as well. The fact that there's a tremendous lack of faith among those who claim to be Catholics. But the solution for these people is not destruction. The solution is conversion. The problem is sin. The solution is conversion. The Pharisees did not respond well to our Lord's preaching, even though they were considered the pillars of religiosity and devotion of their time. When the apostles were totally converted at Pentecost and they went to Samaria, the place that had rejected Jesus in order to preach the gospel, the Samaritans did respond well to it. We actually read that in Acts chapter 8. They did respond well. They embraced the gospel. The patience of our Lord paid off with them. The question is, will our Lord's patience pay off with us as well? That's the question, right? So let's ask Our Lady for the grace to put aside all mediocrity and sloth that we may have. Let's ask her for the grace to have a zeal for the things of God, but a holy zeal, which prioritizes the conversion of minds and hearts and lives, rather than prioritizing things that don't come from God or simply aren't His priority. 
Praise be Jesus and Mary.